Met Police Officer David Carrick has pleaded guilty to 49 sexual offences, including 24 counts of rape spanning over a decade. Carrick passed vetting, despite the fact he'd been previously investigated for harassing a former partner months before. But it seems Carrick may not be an isolated example, with Police Scotland revealing that 25 officers have been suspended over sexual misconduct allegations. Yesterday, Home Secretary Suella Braverman said, public trust in the police is at breaking point. There can be no more excuses. Someone who has publicly condemned the police and is an outspoken advocate for protecting women's safety is writer and activist Judy Bindle. She joins me now. Good evening, Judy. Thanks for joining me. <laughs> this is a very, very serious uh, case. This man, uh, David Carrick, passed uh, vetting. So is this a problem that is just uh, within the system that the police are running at the moment? I mean, it's not just about the vetting. It's about the culture within the police service and not just the Met but across um, the entire service. It's about canteen culture. The canteen culture that we thought, that we hoped had dissipated, had changed back in the 1990s after you know, much chagrin from feminists and from others that saw the system and how it worked and how it operated. Now, I remember back in the 1980s when I first started working alongside the police as a civilian to persuade them uh, and to equip them to better understand violence against women. Uh, when they went out, for example, to a domestic violence call out, where they would simply look in the cupboard, see if there was enough food, check that the children were okay, believe the word of the perpetrator and tell the mother that she shouldn't use such foul language and she shouldn't be drinking. I mean, awful, awful practice. And what we had to do then was explain that sometimes women are angry when they go to these call outs and also that the perpetrators will try to charm them, get them on board uh, one man to another type of thing. And we had a double whammy at the time because of course this was before the Crown Prosecution Service was founded. And so the police did their own charging. So we also had to persuade the police why they should actually charge men, even though they thought that they weren't monsters and looked like perfectly reasonable blokes for rape and sexual assault when there was evidence. And now you fast forward to today and we seem to be surprised that these men take advantage of a culture that we have, which is pretty much impunity. There is an amnesty on rapists at the moment. Let's not even just look within the police service. Let's look across the board. We have a 1% conviction rate for rape from reporting to rape, in other words, a fraction of those that are reported end up with a guilty conviction, unless 99% of women that report rape are making it up, then I think we have a huge problem. And this, of course, filters down into the police service where they know fine well, not only can they get away with harming women if that happens to be their thing, their leisure activity, something they enjoy doing. But they also have the additional tools to tell women that if they report them, then they will be in trouble. And we know from the Centre for Women's Justice, the feminist legal charity, that they have had hundreds of women come forward to report police perpetrated violence against them. And some of these women are serving police officers or were, many of the whistleblowers were ousted, were pushed out, some of them even criminalised. Uh, and others are, are civilians who would have been in a very vulnerable position. Maybe they'd reported domestic abuse or rape and got visited by these men that understand that their warrant card is additional protection for them, gives them additional gall to carry out these acts. So the entire root and branch culture of the police service needs to be changed. And it's a real problem, isn't it, Judy? Because um, w women will rely on the police when they are attacked, when they're in situations with domestic violence. Uh, and if, that, if they, they can't trust that they can go to the police, then this is surely a disaster for women's rights. It is. And in fact, you know, I've engaged as far as I possibly can with the whole defund the police um, arguments about, and you know, I'm sympathetic on one level that what we have is a police service rotten to its core. In my view, we need to to start all over again thinking about how to rebuild it. But defunding the police is not going to end up with a kind of happy anarchist society where crimes are committed, um, and then there's a trust circle 
with the victim in the middle and all of the community surrounding this victim, talking to the perpetrator about how it's really not very nice to torture, rape, uh, murder uh, women and to beat their, their female partners. It doesn't work when it comes to violence against women. So we need a police service because if we didn't have a, a working, functional police service that's fit for purpose, there would be even more violence against women. And quite frankly, we're at an absolutely obscene uh, level of it right now because of the lack of sanctions. So what I would say we need to do is not appeal to the better judgment of these officers, which I have to say, I used to back in the early days, I'd say to them, listen, officer, it's not very nice, is it? Can you imagine if your mother was battered, for example, or that female friend of yours and nobody cared about her? Surely you need to arrest the perpetrator and, and, and prevent this from happening to her again. I would tap into their better judgment. Often there was none, not because they were sociopaths, but because they didn't particularly engage with these arguments. So what we what we did when we changed our tack as feminists working to improve police practice was that we ensured, or we tried to, that if these police officers reneged on their duty, neglected the victims of male violence and did nothing to support them, and we've all seen homicides of women where that has played out, where the police could have protected them and didn't. What we did was we said there has to be sanctions. There has to be serious sanctions against officers that renege on their duty or that commit acts of violence against women themselves. And these sanctions, they're not being Dr. Week's pay. It's not just being told off, being carpeted by their superintendent. It's being sacked. And only then will police officers recognise that they can't do this and get away with it. So uh, um, this kind of process that you're describing of sort of a, 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 a changing the police force from within to make it better, safer for women, that's going to take some time, isn't it? But at the moment, I note the other day that the uh, head of Wimbledon High School, Fanula Kennedy, has advised her girls at the school not to to go to a lone police officer if in trouble. So that's going to create all sorts of problems, isn't it, at the moment? Well, how do we deal with this if, the, if this process is going to take a long time? I mean, it's an emergency situation. It has been for some time. We hear talk about, you know, a bad apple. The barrel is rotten. It has been uh, for so long. It's been allowed to fester. So what we need to do is impose immediate sanctions. We need to look at external reviews, external investigations into poor police practice, into those allegations of abuse. We do not want the police to investigate the police. They do not, it does not work because they will always, always back their colleagues. We know this from police culture. So external reviews, uh, rigorous reviews, but we also need to do something that should have been done a long time ago, which is make it a safe environment for whistleblowers. When somebody, whether it's a direct victim, a female police officer who's been sexually harassed by someone like Wayne Cousins, someone like David Carrick, and we know that these behaviours escalate, and it's exactly what happened with these officers. They got away with the low-level crimes. They escalated to really serious crimes, in Cousins' case, of course, murder. What we need to do is when those whistleblowers want to report problematic behaviour, and that can mean misogynistic jibing, it can mean literally verbal misogyny, or through to direct allegations of wrongdoing and sexual assault, those whistleblowers need to be protected because I'm sick and tired of hearing of women and some men who've blown the whistle being forced out of the police service. And it serves as a warning to everyone else that wants to make an allegation about another officer. We need transparency and we need it urgently. Julie Bindle, thank you very much for joining me.